Hi friends, welcome to the very occasional podcast with Morgan Quaid, now with added salt and coconut oil to give it that summery beach vibe. This episode features the ingeniously creative Sean Hainsworth, writer, publisher, comic creator and owner of SHP Comics. You can find Sean's latest work at shpcomics.com or by asking Alexa where all the cool kids hang out. Before we get to the show, don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast, because if I can get my channel to 500 subscribers, the post office is going to print me my own stamp. Welcome to the very occasional podcast with Morgan Quaid. For those wondering, this is my third attempt to try and get this right, so we'll see how we go. I'm joined today by Sean Hainsworth, a writer, comic creator, and founder of SHP Comics. Welcome, Sean, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And apologies that it took so long for me just to get the intro out, but uh, there we go. We got there. If it had been a little less occasional, you would have nailed it on the first try. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem. You don't do it enough, you don't practice, and it comes out uh, not that great. Uh, all right, so uh, I've known you for a little while. We, we've emailed back and forth and, and uh, been involved in a few things together. So one of the questions that I have, because I know that you do come from a writer writing background uh, and have sort of moved or transitioned from the um, uh, you know TV film sort of area over into comics. So I suppose where did it start with you? Where did writing and creativity and all that sort of stuff start? Did it start more on the filmy side of things or just writing in general? It started a long time ago. I mean, I was one of those kids in high school who was writing a fantasy novel that was way too Tolkien. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> too many elves. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, no, I've always, I've always kind of been wanting to write. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. The film thing came about when I went to college. The film program that was offered was documentary film. And I thought, you know, who wants to make documentary? I want to write something. But I actually really yeah. loved making documentary films. And I think it was... Um, it was really good experience for learning how to structure stories because you you don't control oh. what material you get you you go out in the world and you shoot and then you have to shape and structure the material that you get um so i i ended up making you know documentaries for a while um and uh but i was always writing i was always you know tucking stories away or or, or always working on you know kind of semi finished novels or short stories or screenplays or whatever um right and uh so during the pandemic, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to really do this now. I'm going to really, you know, make an effort. So I wrote uh, three screenplays and I, I sent them around because that was the world that I knew. Um, mm-hmm. And, they, you know, some of them did very well, you know, semifinalist here, quarterfinalist there. Um, and I was invited down to the Austin Film Festival on one of them, you know, and attended a writer's conference. And it just kind of dawned on me in the middle of the conference that I didn't want to do this. It was just you know, all these writers just chasing after anyone who would look at their script. And it was just, yeah. it's kind of, um, you know, it's just very depressing because you have no agency, you have no control, mm. you know, you're just mm. desperate for someone to take an interest in your work and then take your work and basically do what they want with it. And also they own the intellectual property because you don't own intellectual property when you write a screenplay. And, um, you know, I've been a... Um, uh, uh, let's call me a very occasional comic book reader um, throughout <laughs> the years. <laughs> I mean, I actually really loved comics and I was always amazed at the sophistication of the visual storytelling. Like it just, um, mm. when I got interested in film, I would look at comic books and I was just, um, you know, really amazed at how, um, how the story could be told and per- shifts of perspective and um, shifts of time and slowing down of time, all kinds of really interesting things were, were being done. Um, and it just kind of dawned on me, I don't necessarily want to be passive. I want to be active. I want to be a creator. Mm. I don't want to right. be another person running around begging for, you know, agents or whoever to look at my screenplay. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I wanted, and also I wanted to own the intellectual property. Like I'm old enough to think, you mm. know, I've got these stories I've been thinking about for a long time and I don't want to just give them up. And I, and I mm. care how they come out. I don't want to just sell a screenplay and, 
and then kind of go, Ooh, you know, <laughs> that's yeah. not how I would have done it. Um, yeah. you know, I want to be a creator. Um, and so the shift to comics was like, you know, it was like a, the sun went on all of a sudden I went from being passive to being active. All of a sudden I went from, you know, trying to find someone interested in my work to trying to find help people to help me produce my work. Um, right. and, um, and, you know, working with, um, so, you know, I, I cannot draw to save my life. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, in fact, the worst grade I got in college was in drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so there was never any, uh, attempt there to, to be a, a solo creator. Um, but what was really great is when I reached out and I found some artists to work with, um, I just loved the process of collaborating. Um, you know, yeah. here's my vision, here's what I'm thinking. And then we would get sketches back and then we'd look at the sketches and we'd talk about how we could streamline or clarify or, you know, whatever. And it was just such a satisfying process. Right. Um, mm, mm. and, um, and I, I find comic books just so amazing as a visual medium. Like I said, I mean, I really think so much is possible in terms of storytelling and you don't need ridiculous budgets, um, you know, like you do mm. to make a film and therefore you're somewhat free, right? I mean, the constraints of the film industry are that it takes way too much money to produce a film. And so yeah. everybody's got to have their control and make sure that um, the project is going to meet their requirements from a marketing perspective, from a target audience perspective, from, you know, whatever. Um, whereas, um, doing comic books and, and being able to fund them on Kickstarter, um, once again, it just returned everything to me and the process became, how do I make the best comic book that I can? How do I tell the story in the best way that I can? And, uh, mm. never look back, like just so unbelievably happy doing this. Wow. Um, you know, it's just, um, because I'm making these stories come to life. Right. And that's what I've yeah. always wanted to do. Um, and you know, the problem with writing for me as a, like a novel is I just don't have the time. Like a lot of people, I've got a day job in the, in the tech yeah. industry and I, I just don't have it in me to write, you know, 75,000 words. And I also don't think it's necessarily my strong suit. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, and so, um, you know, comic books have become a way to to um, to become an actual creator as opposed to a wannabe creator. And um, yeah, love it. And I love and I love yeah. the community, right? Mm. Like, you know, you and, and and so many people out there who are just doing their own thing. People are supportive. People are, yeah. you know, if, if you know, people are doing all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, uh, and I love the kind of openness um, and the, you know, I, I've not met anyone who's been, you know, unfriendly or competitive or just a jerk. You know, I'm sure they're out there, yeah. but I haven't met them. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> they're there. You just haven't met them. That's, yeah. that's great. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it, it's um, it, it's such an interesting story. Uh, my, myself, uh, I, I've gone slightly the other way and then come back exactly to the same place that you are uh same thing that the whole thirsting after someone to you know please take my screenplay please you know take this thing and, and make it something wonderful but then the realization that well it's gone then as you're handing it over and they may sit on it forever it, it right. may disappear this thing that you love that you've spent years perfecting may just die um <laughs> Hi, my name is Sean Hainsworth, and you're listening to The Very Occasional Podcast. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell, or the AI will take over the world. So how is it different for you now, though? Because uh, as any comic creator would know, you move from being a writer to being effectively a producer slash publisher. Yeah. Um, what's that process been like for you? Well, it's been a, certainly a big learning curve. Um, and, um, you know, as anyone knows, the, um, the economics of comic books are hard, right? I mean, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the States, we're down to, you know, what, 2,500 independent you know, comic book shops. Um, not all of those will carry independence. Um, we have more distributors than we had, you know, before Diamond was the only game in town. Um, but the other thing as an independent creator is that it takes me and the artist months to create an issue, yeah. right? And part of the problem is that the comic book community, I mean, they show up every Wednesday and they they want issue two, right? Uh, and they want it 
you know, four weeks right after away. they got issue one and they want issue three. And it's really hard to compete in that space at this point with when I'm, you know, generating material more slowly. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, um, so, yeah, that's really the trick right now is um, Kickstarter is a godsend, right? Because um, yeah. it's the one place you can really kind of monetize directly to the people who care about your work and uh mm. and um you know and, and get the money to pay the artists to you know print to to get over the hump um and that's that's been really interesting and i, I really feel like that's that's what i'm building to um once again my goal is to establish this intellectual property long term like i believe in the three stories that i'm doing right now and mm -hmm. i think once i get to like five issues you know for one maybe seven issues for the other and I have the trade paperback and I've got the full story, then I think I'm going to have a lot more options. Right. Um, so yeah, yeah. for right now I'm kind of just hanging back, working with Kickstarter um, and hoping that as I get, you know, once I get those five issues, then maybe I could start putting them out in comic book shops and do one each month. Right. So, um, you know, go right, back yeah. and kind of actually release them um, in order or look to the trade paperback, um, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's been a real learning curve. Um, and you know, the good thing is I've been doing, you know, business computers, you know, I've been a computer programmer in businesses for a long time. So I'm not scared of the business side of things. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves and figure out, mm -hmm. you know, contracts and intellectual property and distribution deals and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed it, but it's it's hard, as most creators know, it is hard to turn that corner as an independent. Yeah, and it's good, like you say, it's good to have a, a background where you're, as you say, you're not fearful of the business side of things because a lot of creators don't realize when you get into it, that's a big part of a big chunk yeah. of what you're doing, um, which is not always what you're signing up for when you're, you're writing and you're thinking, no, no, someone else could do all that filthy kind of business stuff, and I will just create the pure idea and the you know, all that sort of stuff, but it's got to happen. It needs to happen. That would be ideal, but it, yeah, <laughs> I know it's like, I'm in the middle of the third issue, writing the third issue of Woodstake right now. And I'm, I'm loving it, but I, it's been like 10 days since I've been able to even write. Right. Cause it's like, I'm closing out yeah. one Kickstarter and getting ready for another one and, you know, and fulfilling and, you know, to getting, you know, yeah. de de dealing with printers. And I just, I, it's been 10 days since I've been able to write. So yeah, no, those moments, I, I appreciate them more now because it's like, okay, I've, I've got, you know, time this week and I'm going to finish this script and that's the fun part. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff he's got to do. Yeah. Spot on. Spot on. All right. So let's talk about, uh, so the, the three comics that you're talking about, I know of, of all three, um, and they each have, uh, very unique ideas. Um, and I think ideas that have a lot of, a lot of length to them in terms of scope for the plot and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, what well, you mentioned uh, Woodstake, so why don't we start with that? A little, little bit of a, what's the story? Where did the idea come from? Uh, the artwork is amazing, but you know, I'll just say that as someone that's seen it. But um, yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, project? Yeah, I mean, and that was the one right when the pandemic started, where the idea hit me. And um, I mean, it's a simple idea. There's a vampire at Woodstock in 1969, um, and um, <laughs> it just has a lot of potential for comedy of horrors. And uh, I really like the mashup of comedy and horror, um, you know, Shaun of the yep. Dead, um, <laughs> you know, when they're they're throwing their album collection at the zombies and fighting over which records they <laughs> should throw, <laughs> which one, they, yeah. And it's just, uh, yeah. and so um, bringing a vampire, what, what also is great is, you know, that, um, I mean, I, I was born in the 60s, you know, 66, so I was way too young for Woodstock, but I kind of grew up in the 70s in the shadow of, you know, hippie culture. Um, and it, it's interesting wow. to kind of look at hippie culture from a distance now, because in, on, on the one hand, it was really remarkable. On the other hand, it was just so naive, right? And so <laughs> yeah. not, not going to work. Um, and so um, uh, bringing probably what is most cynical creature on the planet like a vampire right someone who just sucks the life out of people and leaves their dead bodies by the side of the road so bringing in like the most yeah. cynical creature in the universe into the heart of hippie peace love and naivete it was just a delicious idea right so um <laughs> yeah so that's yeah. the one that i wrote as a screenplay um first and um you know what's really interesting from a creative process is that i did three drafts of the screenplay and i'm like okay i've done as much as i can do with this i can't do any more 
Um, I, I don't know what to do with mm. this anymore. It's it's done, right? You know. Um, but then yeah. when I started producing it as a as a comic book, it was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I all these new ideas came to me, and I was like, so why is there a vampire in upstate New York, right? I need I need a backstory, right? I uh, and um, yeah. and uh, actually working serially is really great for me. Like, um, you know, so, you know, I, I, um, I have the whole script, so I know where the story's going, but mm. um, working issue by issue, it's very different. Like in a screenplay, you have kind of a three act structure, right? Um, but with the comic books, you have issues structure, right? Every issue has to have a beginning, middle and, and an end. Right. It has to have yeah. a bit of a cliffhanger. Um, it has to move the story forward. Um, you know, you have to develop the characters as you're going and it, it's really, a lot of fun in 28 pages, which is what I'm doing to, um, to, to try to make all of those things work. Um, and so I'm rewriting as I go and, um, and having a great time with it. Um, you know, it's just interesting because the first issue is a lot of setup. Um, and, uh, the yeah. second issue gets pretty dark in some ways. And the, th it's not until the third issue that we start getting into the comedy. So it's funny. It's like, I'm saying this is a comedy of horrors, but if you read the first two issues, it's going to be like, dude, there's no comedy. Just horrors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming, you know? <laughs> that's like a joke you have to just keep telling until it gets funny. And then, yeah, that's oh, funny. Yeah. yeah, it'll be fun. Exactly. Um, wow. But yeah, okay, so, that's, so that's, 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 that's one. Mistake. And, and yeah. just the artist on that one, yeah, I found him online. Um, he's a young Brazilian guy. Um, he had some marvelous work on his website. Um, and he's really mm. interesting because he works, um, he doesn't do kind of traditional inks um, and color. He does um, 3D modeling and he actually does like full 3D rendered models. And then uh -huh. um, he paints, digitally paints, but the painting is very, you know, rough. A lot of uh, paint strokes, it's not. Uh, and so yeah. um, you don't really perceive it as 3D in a lot of ways because because what it turns into is is very painterly. Um, but yeah. what the 3d allows us to do is kind of move the camera around, you know, cause once you've got the scene built and the characters built, you can rotate the camera and the computer and find the angles that you want. So I actually find myself uh -huh. storyboarding with him. Like I, I draw stick figures, oh, wow. um, and I'm like the cameras here and here's the frame because when he builds the model, we can actually rotate the camera. And so it's fun. Like the Woodstake is definitely the most cinematic in the sense of, you know, you'll, the camera will kind of roll up on top of a scene or we even use yeah. um, what, you know, or what's called a rake focus where there's two characters in the frame and one is in focus and one is blurry and then it pulls focus. So the other one's in focus and the other one's blurry. Yeah, right? so that is it, cool. it, it has a lot of cinematic um, uh, look and feel to it. Um, yeah. But really the painterly style is awesome. And, and Felipe is a really talented young artist um, and, uh, and really working hard. Like our first issue was good um but we're like okay how do we improve it and he wants to improve the art and every time he wants to improve the art every time he wants every issue to be better and i, I just yeah. love that like he's young and he's hungry and he wants to do the best possible job he can do so yeah it is great and it's it's uh striking when when you first sort of see the the artwork yeah it really jumps out at you that that um not quite impressionist, but like you say, sort of heavy, heavy strokes, vibrant yeah. colors, rich. Uh, yeah, it, it is really, really cool. And yeah. it kind of sets it apart as well from the typical comic uh, look and feel, um, which is really cool. It's Monty Moore. I'm a 30-year comics veteran in comics, games, and movies, and you've been watching one of my absolute favorite podcasts, Catch the Craze. You are watching Catch the Craze. What am I listening to? And you're listening to Catch the Craze. Where are all the indies at? A Catch the Craze podcast. What are you watching? I'm watching Catch the Craze. What are you going to do? Subscribe now to Catch the Craze, the number one show online for independent. Have you subscribed to? You are an independent. Catch the craze. Making moves on your own. Catch the craze. On your grind in the streets. Catch the craze. Join the movement. Catch the craze. Uh, one of the other um, uh, books that you've come out with uh, is uh, about a robot. Yes. But a very particular kind of robot. Yes. Um, 
uh, a, a sex robot, uh, effectively, or, <laughs> yes. or a, you know, or yes. a companion, or whatever we, we want to say. Um, tell us a little bit about that because that, that that's a that's another fascinating and and you know humorous uh, look at at um, essentially a design problem, I'd say. But yeah, tell us a bit about that. Uh, that problem. That's exactly it. So you know, I work as a software developer, and um, you know, uh, I've sat in endless software design meetings, um, and. Uh, you know, gone through different methodologies. You know, everybody now is kind of uses the agile methodology for working through yeah. problems. And, uh, you know, it just kind of, and I, I was on a really dysfunctional team where, <laughs> you know, they thought they were so agile and they were so not agile. Like everything was like this ridiculous process that did not add any value and just took time away from the actual work. Um, not, I mean, Agile is a great methodology, but it can be implemented well and it can be implemented not well. This was really not well. And um, it just kind of struck me um, how funny it would be, like, how, what would it actually be like to build a sex robot? So it's not a sex yeah. robot story about, you know, oh, this incredible sex robot. And it's like, no, <laughs> how, how, how do you debug this thing, right? I mean, at yeah. some point, you've got to yeah. put a real person in front of it. That's and, right. That's uh, right. You know, all the things that could go wrong. And it's got to, from a technical perspective, it's got to, you know, process natural language. It's got to be interactive. It's got to... Um, you know, uh, you know, uh, have direct contact with uh, people, and then things can go wrong. <laughs> so yeah, it just kind of struck yeah. me, like, what if we just spun the story around, and it was about the technical challenges and of doing this? And then um, this one actually started out as a novel. I wrote about 150 pages of the novel. Um, and actually, you know, once again about comic books, which is great. You know, I was writing this novel, and I was like. Who the heck is going to publish or read this <laughs> novel? It's like kind of weird softcore porn, but funny. But like, what? Who is going to publish this novel? Um, and I was like, why am I doing this? And um, but when I started doing comics, I was like, oh yeah, it's perfect because yeah. it's, it's a very visual it. story. It's made for yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And as an independent, I can make this weird, you know, kind of semi you know, 17 plus, but funny office comedy. Cause a lot of it really is an office comedy. And you know, yeah. the, the thing that brought it together for me was, you know, once again, like the jokes are there, um, like in Woodstake, the jokes are there, but there has to be characters you care about. And there has to be more going on thematically than just, you know, uh, hitting the jokes because it will just get flat over time. Um, yeah, yeah. And so um, that's where kind of the main character, Samantha is a young, um, really smart, you know, Yale School of Management, you know, graduate who who goes into this firm with with high hopes of uh, of really, be, you know, being on a cutting edge firm, and she ends up working with a bunch of guys who are just, you know, <laughs> kind of Neanderthals and don't do their <laughs> job very well, and would rather be on the golf course and dismiss her ideas out of hand, and yeah. um, and so uh, her her sort of challenge um in this workplace became the foil for a lot of the other things and gave me the depth of story and the character and so um you know that was that was when it went from a funny idea to an actual story um and so yeah, yeah. and i think any anyone that's worked in a corporate environment will immediately respond to the the kind of conversations that go on in the yeah. You know, the just the the cataclysm of errors and foreseeable things going wrong that you think, well, that is exactly how things would play out in the real world because yeah. this is the, this is what these places are like. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. It always makes me laugh when people talk about the efficiency of private industry. I'm like, yeah, I've never oh, worked man. in private industry. It's not that efficient. You know, no. I mean, some no. places are, I'm sure, but the places I've been have not. Been. <laughs> I've never worked at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so they're they're the the the, the first two. Now the third uh, um, story is more of a, I suppose, maybe sweeping, you know, sci-fi kind of um, epic. Um, tell us a little bit about that one because that's what you know. You, you said your initial foray into writing was was a Tolkien esque kind of thing. That for me as well, the fantasy and sci-fi and everything that was the yeah. first passion. So tell tell us yeah. about this book. Yeah, I, I think um, in some ways I was really inspired by. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, um, you know, in 2001, um, I mean, the movie is so marvelous as a film person. Um, but, uh, what's interesting is with a lot of Kubrick films, you have to read the book to get a totally different experience because Kubrick will just sort of pick and choose the images that he wants and throw 90% of the story away. Um, you yeah. know, which he did with the shining and which he did with, 
Um, and they're marvelous films, right? I'm not taking anything. I would never dare take anything away from Stanley Kubrick. But the, yeah. the novels themselves are really rich. And um, I just loved the ideas of 2001 and this idea of, um, you know, kind of the relationship of an alien race, um, you know, and and sort of getting into the nature of life and, you know, the sort of the star child at the end. And so I think a lot of those ideas were at play. Um, and so, yeah, I'm trying to make a, a big, you know, fairly sweeping epic sci-fi with um, some really good, like thoughtful science behind it. Um, mm. But, you know, mixed up with, you know, what what's coming across, I think, is some pretty traditional Star Trek kind of action. Right. So, right. Um, you know, it's it's trying to to balance being, you know, cerebral, if I can use that word, you know, Ted Chang. Um, you know, I love the Ted Chang short, short stories. They're really, uh, really amazing. Um, I also enjoyed um, Six in Lou's um, Remembrance of Earth's Past is a trilogy, a Chinese science fiction writer has some really great ideas behind it. So yeah, that was the challenge was to try to come up with a story and it, it really kind of revolves around the nature of life. So the, the conceit is what if we found an object you know, they find an object, you know, deep, deep in the ocean, which appears to be responsible for, you know, seeding life on, on planet Earth, where the amino, basic amino acids and the chemical building blocks of life actually seem mm -hmm. to be, you know, generated by this object. And so then the question is, was the, you know, they call the object the hand of God. Some people call the object the hand of God. But, you know, was, uh, but is it, you know, was it seated there by an alien race? Was it some kind of random space spore? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then the one of the main characters is, um, you know, is a, a robot who, um, and, and there's some metaphysical conversations in there. And I don't want to make it sound too, you know, too brainy because there is a good amount of action, but there's some you yeah. know, thoughts in there about, you know, about the nature of life. Like what, when does function become life? Like when a robot can do everything a human can do, it's still not really alive, right? There's that, yeah. that, that extra, that soul, that spark, that, you know, whatever. Something, and so yeah. uh, I'm really trying to play with these ideas about kind of the nature of life in the universe. So it's a big story, but once again, like in 28 pages, you can only do so much. So I introduce yeah. like one character and throw you into a battle, but I don't really give you much background for the battle. Uh, issue two, which is coming out soon, is gonna introduce the hand of God and you know, start introducing some of the bigger ideas, and then really, it's going to be until that maybe issue three or issue four before the the scope of the story comes out. So this one, I'm a little not worried about, but um, I, I'm hoping people will come along for the ride. You know, so it's like, well, yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that was good, but just wait because I think it's going to get a lot more interesting. Um, my brother's funny. My brother read it. He was like, yeah, it was kind of like an amuse bouche, you know, it was like, it was like kind of interesting, <laughs> but you know, where's it, you know, where, what's the next step? And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. It's 28 pages and there's another step coming and it's going to be cool, but you got to wait for it, <laughs> you know? So, and it's a, that's a tricky one as well, because you, uh, so a lot of, a lot of, uh, publishers will say, if you go to them, uh, we want the whole thing, the whole story arc. So do yeah. a graphic novel, um, not, you know, appreciating, I guess, but the amount of money and time and effort oh, yeah. involved in doing say seven or eight, you know, individual, you know, issues and then combining them. Whereas the way that you're doing it is, you know, get one out, get a, a little bit of funding, a little bit of interest to help, you know, and then do the next one. And do, so, yeah, there is that patience thing. People have to wait, but certainly yeah. on the creator side, at least it's out there and it's moving and people can see it. But, um, that that's the risk if it's a if it's a bit of a slow burn at the start it's like just stick yeah. with me people stick with me stick just, with me um, please yeah exactly yeah, it uh <laughs> just hang in there yeah. um yeah it's the the perennial issue for the uh the comic creator um so tell us about uh something that you're willing to share obviously uh a time like a um a failure effectively a failure that you've had that has been really instructive that you learn a lot through uh either what to do or what not to do not to do yeah um, let me think about that. Um, there's been no shortage of failures, <laughs> so I have to think about the best one. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was really convinced I was going to sort of be a documentary filmmaker. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of got to the point where I realized, um, what I was making, what I wanted to make, the kinds of films that I wanted to make, um, were not, not really going to be a good fit for, 
for you know what was being successful out there and documentary film like comic books is a hard world right there's not not yeah, a ton of money yeah. in it um and that was it was interesting because when i was doing documentary that's when documentary film was becoming very narrative right that's when reality yeah, TV yeah. was taking off and people were really structuring documentary like narrative right and and mm. and um and cheating a little bit to get the story just so and that was that was yeah. not why I got into documentary film. And it was hard to compete with that because people have these amazing... The other thing with documentary is, you you know, you kind of have to find the amazing story, right? Like, you know, just... Yeah, yeah. You know, the top yeah. of my head, like, you can't Shady invent Man, it. Like that. Like, what an incredible yeah. story. Of course, it's an amazing film. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, I kind of burned out on the documentary film. Um, and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll call that a failure. Um, I think any... Uh, I, ultimately, personally, I never really wanted to move to L.A. Like, I was never... I like where I live and I like being mm. a dad and I like being home a lot. And I, you know, I, my day job is, gives me a lot of flexibility. So, um, you know, these kind of dreams I had of being a screenwriter or whatever, you know, kind of a fail. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I think you just keep going along until you find the path that allows you to do the thing that you want to do. And it honestly took me yeah. a long time. I mean, I'm in my fifties now. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it took me a long time and comic books were once again, kind of the, the, the bright light that, you know, the, the light bulb that went on, I, was like, I can actually do this. And I have so many stories. I have like, you know, 10, 15 stories, you know, sketched yeah. out over the years. So I've got a lot of material. Um, and, um, like the idea that I could just spend the next 15, 20 years realizing these stories is a very happy thought. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping I can find an audience and, keep building the following on Kickstarter and, you know, and, and somehow find a way to keep doing this because it's, um, it is kind of, uh, what I've been looking for and a lot of false starts, um, trying to find an outlet for that creativity. I think a lot of people are the yeah. same way, right? You feel like there's something yeah. inside of you and you want to get it out. And, um, but the realities of the world and the realities of, of what medium, what format, what, how you would get it out, you know? And so yeah. this has just been the right fit for me, but it took a long time to get there. Yeah. And look, there were a lot of, a lot of barriers to this sort of thing. And I, I suppose historically up until the last 10 years, there have been, this wouldn't have been an option, you know, or not yeah. as viable an option. So it's kind of a perfect storm of the right time to do this sort of stuff as well. And the indie comics community is huge at the moment, which is fantastic. Or, uh, you know, I'm hearing comic book sales are down and yet there's so many more people creating, you know, great indie content. So we'll see, Internet. We'll see. We'll I... see. Yeah, exactly. I think the whole market is shifting. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, the, you know, the traditional comic book market, and I'm not the person to talk about this because I don't have the 10,000 foot view on the industry. Um, but, you know, yeah. maybe the, you know, the traditional comic book market um, you know, is changing and maybe shrinking. Um, but the interest in comics and the explosion of creators, um, it, you know, yeah, yeah. We're, we're going somewhere new with this and somewhere good and web comics opens up options and, um, yeah. you know, not my favorite way to read a book, but a lot of people, you know, that's the way they want to read A lot of people it. like it. Yeah. And they're my far and away, my favorite customers. Because you just send them the PDF or the digital the version. PDF. I know. No postage, no delays, no anything. They're amazing. Yeah. Shout out to all of the digital readers out there. Please uh, <laughs> keep going. Um, so uh, tell us about an idea that you may have that you're willing to share, something that has is either too difficult to tackle that you've wanted to tackle or you just it's sitting on the back catalog somewhere or the shelf somewhere, something that's either too profound, too traumatic or too too wild that you just thought not yet yeah um uh well i just did erotic which is pretty wild so <laughs> um that yeah yeah i don't have anything wilder than that um, i was gonna say i'm talking to someone that that, uh, that has just released a thing about a sex robot so yeah yeah exactly it's pretty uh, far out there malfunctioning sex robot um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um yeah I, you know i would uh, Honestly, um, uh, I do have, I think what's great about comics these days is that it's just a medium. It's not necessarily a genre, right? I think mm. um, for many years, people associate comic books with, you know, superheroes and, or certain kinds of stories, right? And, yeah. um, 
and I think, you know, that got exploded in the seventies with, you know, Art Spiegelman's mouse and, um, you know, mm. a lot of the underground stuff that was done. And I think, you know, Neil Gaiman kicked it open a little bit with Sandman. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, I did start a documentary and I, I would like to do something more, um, kind of, you know, realistic, real kind of drama, um, you know, in a comic book format, that's not, you know, vampires, aliens, or sex robots. Um, right. but, um, but just humans then <laughs> just, just normal just humans. humans. Yeah. You know, like one, one <laughs> example would be Dan Close's um, eight ball, you know, which was just mm -hmm. really a story of character and it was remarkable. Um, you know, um, so I think I'd like to start going in that direction, but, um, but not yet. Um, you know, number yeah. one, I've bitten off three stories and it's a lot That's and I need, a to lot. Get, yeah. I need to get them out there. Um, and yeah. you know, finish what's on your plate, young man, before you, that's you it. know, exactly. So, um, yeah, but that's, I, I would like to do something that that's more kind of, you know, I, I would say indie film in a certain way, but I don't want to make mm -hmm. an indie film. I just want to do something that's a little more, um, you know, character driven and a little more, um, serious, not, not the best word or, um, I don't know. Every word I come up with, yeah. I don't like like socially relevant or whatever, but you know something, little, you know, to take to take the genre even in 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 a different direction, which is you know, um, it doesn't have to even be kind of fantasy or you know whatever. It can be. It, it's just a visual mm. storytelling medium. That's what it is, and um, so I'd I'd like to push in that direction a little bit at some point. And that that's an interesting challenge as well because most of us are familiar with um, one of the benefits of the the comic book medium is action and being able to surprise when turning a page over and have these full page spreads and all of this, you know, blood and guts and all that sort of stuff going on. So it's an interesting, uh, it's something frankly, that is beyond me that I probably wouldn't attempt um, because I, I would get too much in my head and then, well, there has to be a ninja killing someone. <laughs> right, exactly, you know, yeah. I, I would, the restraint <laughs> is not my, my biggest thing, but yeah, it is that, that issue of, of telling a more sub visually subdued story, I suppose, but with emotion and heart and all those other things going on. Yeah. It's a really interesting, interesting idea, but I'll leave that one to you. Not I'll probably fail else. at it, but that's, that's what I'd like to do. <laughs> well, if you do, then you can come back. I uh, just, add, you, you know, know I'll just add the ninja. Question. Yeah. Add a ninja. That's add right. You ninja. just add a ninja yeah. wherever you want. <laughs> Kids, if you're watching uh, and you need to pep up your homework or whatever, just add a ninja. That's that's our advice. Never a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're going to move to the next uh, little segment of our show here. The worst pitch. Essentially, we try and come up with a pitch that is truly disastrous or just not viable for Hollywood these days. Uh, I should add the caveat without being offensive or anything like that, because there are certain stories that would be, you know, non-viable for other reasons, but just a truly silly idea. Um, now, I have an idea locked and loaded because I have a catalogue of bad ideas ready to go at any time, but I will give you the option to go first, sir, if you would like. Uh, you put me on the spot here. You know, it's funny. I actually think... Um... Uh, depending on how you do it, a lot of what sound like bad ideas can turn out to be quite good. Like, look at Captain Captain Underpants, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So successful. Yeah. And it's like, you know, a mean principal turns into a superhero and wears underwear, right? Like, <laughs> that sounds like a terrible idea. Um, but, yep. uh, but, you know, my son works. reads every single one of them religiously. So, um, yeah, you know what? What I go to, you know what I'm, I'm really interested in? One of the worst Hollywood films adaptations of a comic book of all time is Howard the Duck. Um, this is right. a film wow, made, you're going deep now. You're going deep. deep now. It's made by Lucas film. I don't think, I don't know if Lucas was involved in it, but um, at, I would love to look at the comic book for Howard the Duck and see how they went so terribly wrong with it um, and see if the comic book is, kind of, you know, cigar chomping, um, you know, uh, um, you know, wise guy duck. And I don't even know more much beyond that, but um, yeah, yeah I, I'm not thinking of a, of an original disaster. I'm thinking of kind of investigating existing disasters. So please save me and tell me your bad idea. All right. I'll tell you my bad idea. And just so the people know, I, I had three come up while we were talking. So the one that I'm going to go with um, which I've written down the title first, 
the Benjamin button. So essentially, this is a, a, a button that is put in people's houses. And when they get to a certain age, they press the button and they begin to slowly age backwards. But it's very tightly monitored around who can, you know, use this button and everything. And then the, eventually there becomes a bit of an issue where there's overpopulation because the older people are starting to get younger and the youngers are coming up and there's, you know, wars and rumors of wars and who knows what else. But the, it, essentially, the Benjamin Button. That's the idea. I have to say, that's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> I think that could be quite interesting. I mean, the Benjamin Button. We need to work on the title. <laughs> we can't. The title is my favorite worst yeah. part of that yeah, idea. The actual yeah. idea is fine. The title, yeah. the title is horrible. But... Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That I've got. I've got part of it. Then I've got that. But yeah, you got a little bit of Logan's Run going on in there. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the age thing and uh, I'm dating you know. myself here. Howard the Howard the Duck, the Logan's Run. Yeah, <laughs> that's all right. All of our uh, teenage girl uh, listeners won't know what we're. You know, the many many teenage girls that listen to this won't uh, be aware of any of those. That's what the internet's for. That's exactly right. You can look yeah. it up forever. Um, all right. Well, it's up to you. Did you want to come up with a fresh one, or are you happy? Are you content to lay it all on Howard the Duck? Uh, I, why don't you go with another one and let the wheels turn a little bit? Because you said you had three, so give me one more to think of something. <laughs> all right. All right. So, uh, okay. The, an, an office worker works in a corporate environment in, in an office in the city. He goes down to pick up some printing supplies down to the, the cupboard and they're not there. And he has to go further down into the sort of basement area and he just walks and walks and walks and he gets lost and he can't find his way out. Uh, and he dies in the building of, uh, you know, thirst and starvation. That's it. <laughs> that would be hard. Pretty yeah. bad. Pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah. Do you have a title for that one? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't think of a title for that one. But um, it would be something to do with printers or cartridges or yes, something like that. Or you give it a really thrilling, exciting title, and then people go and watch it and uh, just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> smash right. you on on yeah, they, they just hate it. Um, but yeah, that one I I find that the the worst pitches are ones that they're kind of like a joke that gets to the point of the climax of the joke, and then it nothing happens, and it right. just because it's like, well, what was the point of that? There was no yeah. Anyway. I, I, I was thinking along the lines of science fiction that maybe if we uh, we finally made contact with an alien race and we we got there and it turned out that they were just terribly boring. There was nothing interesting about them. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just the bureaucrats. World was boring. The people were boring. There was nothing to learn from yep. them. Yes, yeah. there's, there's no but war. They don't have any and, resources. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's just yeah, we would rather have not met them. <laughs> Their, their technology is kind of 80s level compared yeah, to us, exactly. so it's not, we can't Game borrow anything from years, them. You have to blow <laughs> the dust off in order to get them working again. <laughs> See, again, though, that has the workings of a good comedy. I think, you know, yeah. that you build up all the expectation, they arrive, and then they pull out their Sega Genesis, and you think, yes. ah, but but, but they're we just have... So boring. <laughs> yeah, the boring, the boring angle is really nice. You, you, there you go. All right, that was the worst pitch, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to move now to rapid fire questions. All right. First one, uh, you have one choice and you have to choose Star Wars, Star Trek. Star Wars. Oh, I no thought problem. you were going to go the Trek. There you, you go. Did. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, if you would ask me when I was younger, I might have. I was a big, uh, Kirk was my generation but um yeah no st star wars when star wars came out in 77 it like changed our lives like it was just it yeah was it's pretty transformational profound for i was 11 when it came out and we yeah. just were so obsessed with it so yeah gotta go star wars star wars it is very good all right so the near future uh there's a mandate handed down that everyone must have one tattoo and only one tattoo all other ink is plate you know cleansed from the body and you have to get a single tattoo. What is that tattoo and where do you get it? SHP Comics logo. That's branding, people. That's, That's branding. branding. Yes. That Very was, clever. You see what I did there? I slipped that yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Well, where would you where would you get it? On my app. No. Um, I uh <laughs> um it's yeah. not very good branding if you put that's it there unless you're going to walk around yeah, no. showing people. Yeah. yeah, that's what I think of my brand. It belongs <laughs> to the sun, no, no I, I think I'm, I, I think on my horribly underdeveloped bicep, yes. 
<laughs> right. On the arm. I can make a so you can, uh, I develop my muscles. You can do suns out, guns out, and show people the, uh, exactly, the branding. Exactly. Exactly. I'm very a good. annoying guy. <laughs> <laughs> very good. All right. So which of your heroes, uh, or people you look up to, would you most hate to meet in person or fear to meet in person? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I've kind of got Kubrick on the brain just because we were talking about Kubrick and he was like mm. a really crazy, recluse, strange dude. very strange dude. Um, yeah. So, um, yes, I don't think I would want to meet him in person, but I admire him enormously. There you go. Good choice. Yeah. In fact, Kubrick is a good choice for all of these questions. All right. Yeah. So, Kubrick. Uh, That's Kubrick. My answer. All right. Well done. Excellent answer. <laughs> Uh, what is a fictional death that was hard for you to deal with either in film or TV or novels or whatever? You mean that hit me emotionally? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. a Bambi moment or yes. sorry, a Bambi's Bambi's mother's moment. Well, I have to say this wasn't a death, but I have to say I was pretty devastated when ET went home. Um, <laughs> now that, you're talking that, my language. That wrecked me as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, I was heartbroken with that. Um, the other one that I was heartbroken with younger was, um, the novel where the red fern grows, um, cause oh, the dog okay. gets it. Um, I don't know why they read all, they read all these books about where the dog gets it to kids in school, old yeller, and where the red fern, red, where the red fern grows. Nobody reads where the red fern grows anymore. Um, but, uh, yeah, don't kill the dog. That's just, no, yeah. I mean, maybe it's, it's part of, uh, society's way of molding children so that they don't grow up to be sociopaths but maybe it doesn't work that way if you if you're constantly reading about dogs dying maybe you're thinking well this one's gonna die so let's just i don't know it's very weird pulling at the heartstrings just to sell books these people i've got to give a reference that happened after 1985 so i'm gonna keep trying here you keep thinking of something that's uh <laughs> <laughs> that the kids would the kids would know my daughter's teaching me pop music she's like who is this in the car i'm like uh dua lipa no she's <laughs> i'm trying to learn so i don't sound like a total idiot <laughs> i uh that's a straw too far for me i'm afraid that one i won't uh, won't be doing that anytime soon all right so you're allowed to pass on one toy from your childhood to your children what is that toy that you would pass on oh. Maybe the Atari 2600. I tried that actually, because they with the Xbox you can get the old 2600 games. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, Look, kids, asteroids. They were so not interested in it, but uh, yeah, that was the toy from my childhood. Was the Atari 2600? Mm -hmm. That's a good choice because it's playability, replayability. Yeah, lots of games with it. That's a that's a good choice. One I hardly endorse. That gets the Morgan Quaid uh, badge of. Fun times endorsement. I still haven't gotten out of the 80s, so let's keep going. That Yeah, well, that's, I mean. But the know, 80s is back. Stranger Things, Kate Bush, yeah, it's yeah. all back. The kids love it. It's one of those things that just keeps coming back and back and, and you know, it'll be big hair next. Can't wait for that <laughs> <Hope> one. <not. laughs> all right, so you have to invent a new color. What is it and why? Hmm. It's a tricky one. Hard-hitting questions here at the Very Occasional Podcast. Yes, I would like to invent a, uh, like a, can, can it be more than one color? I'm thinking of like a mood, yeah. ring, mood ring aura where someone's emotions would be visible as some kind of colorful aura around them. So we could, we could, uh, we could see what people were thinking and feeling for real. Cool. Mm. Again, though. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the mood ring. Admittedly, they don't oh, work. But, uh, 70s. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty. Yeah. They're pretty. They're, pretty, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're a way back. Uh, <laughs> but so, that's all right. I'm so <laughs> old. Uh, your your viewers have all turned this off. <laughs> <laughs> they're all on the internet looking up mood ring. Mood rings. Yeah. What is? Yeah. Um, uh, so you have to do a fondue. No, I'm just joking. That's not a. Oh, I like fondue. I just thought I'd, yeah. I thought I'd throw another set of fondue. In. Yeah. Indeed. Um, uh, okay. In the distant future, um, there is a new servant class that uh, that serves humanity, cooks for us, cleans for us, all that sort of stuff. It's yes, it's unjust, but we managed to live with it. A human servant class, not a machine servant class. No, well, this is the choice you see. So there is a choice between two, and you have to make that on behalf of humanity. It's either robots, AI, that sort of thing, or it's demons 
and demonic creatures and entities and those sorts of things. Which robots. would you choose? Robots. Yeah. Not even a yeah. Not even a, that's gonna no be hesitation. Easy. Who wants a demon as a servant? <laughs> well, I'm I'm thinking only people that are scared of the Skynet uh, eventuality uh, yeah. happening. Yeah. No, it's um. Yeah, I mean, I actually gonna I I do some work in AI, um, so um, it's interesting. I, I think um, I don't think. Well, I'm gonna break some people's hearts. I don't really think Skynet is that much of a possibility. Um, I, I'm not I'm not so concerned about self aware, um, because unless things change drastically, but the way things work now is it's basically a very advanced pattern recognition. Um, but yeah, that's not not leading towards self-aware so yeah no bring on the robots well put put my mind at ease because yeah that's uh with the you know ai images that are coming up and all these sorts of things happening it um scares the pants out of me not yeah, out of well, me. you know what's interesting is there's something called um so and i'm gonna bore your viewers a little bit here listeners here a little bit but um so one of the things you can do is call, what's called neural transfer so you build a neural network that learns the pattern of something and then you right. can transfer that to new content. So you could you could have it right in the style of Shakespeare. You could have it paint in the style of Van Gogh. You could have oh, it because wow. it learns the style of Van Gogh, and then you give it a new image, and then it will Van Goghize it, right? Um, oh, wow. And so this is where a lot of this artwork is is being generated. Um, and uh, but I still think ultimately it's a great parlor trick. But um, mm. it's just going to become so commonplace. Like people thought photography would destroy art, right? If you could just take pictures of things. Yeah, it would that's destroy true. painting, right? Be because it was automatic. But um, so, yeah, the AIs will be spitting out all these images and some will be interesting and they'll use them in advertising. But, um, the, you know, it's not going to take the human soul out of art. There's still going to be, you know, uh, the AI is never going to create art like a human can create art. It can create very cool images, but um, hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm not worried about that one. They're not um, coming for our jobs. <clears throat> not yet. Not yeah. yet. Well, well, we'll see. But demons, we know what <clears throat> what the deal is with demons. They're demonic. They're demonic. Yeah, I really They're don't demonic. want a demon serving me. I would never trust it. <laughs> no. <laughs> There'd have to be some sort of shackle system or something going on. The other thing is there, there's always this... Uh, this assumption um, that AI and robots and all that sort of stuff is is going to go is going to be human. In other words, you give it power and it will abuse that power. It, you know, there's we can't conceive of an alien species or uh, robots or anything like that that is wholly good and has no interest in oppressing other people. So you know, it's right. We just read everything through our own our own crappy. We per we personify everything. We we perceive yeah. every you know. We, we make our dogs more human than they are, you know, our pets. We make our, you know, and, and what's really interesting is they actually use robots like in, um, uh, you know, like old age homes in Japan. And, um, you know, oh, a lot of the older people get used to it and they they personify it and they feel emotionally connected to it. And it, it, it's it's really interesting. But that's all coming from us. That's not coming from the yeah. robot, right? No. So, yeah, I mean, um, uh, I think the, 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 the thing that scares me with AI is the way it can be used by, you know, um, governments or companies to, um, you know, control us uh, more. I'm not worried about the AI controlling us. I'm more worried about it's the, the people human, using that. It's the yeah. people using it. Yeah, that that yeah. scares me a lot more than the machine itself. Uh, well, thank you, Sean, for joining us on the very occasional podcast. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning about your your creative journey, and also putting my fears a little bit to bed around the AI uh, disaster that is invariably coming towards us. Uh, so, thank you very much for joining us uh, on the very occasional podcast. This was super fun. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs>